On the upper right-hand portion of the Archbishop's coat of arms is a white field with the insignia of the Capuchin Franciscan Order, bearing the arms of Christ and of Saint Francis, surmounted by a cross. In high school I was reading really about the life of Saint Francis. I was attracted by his simplicity his poverty and his humility and really his obedience to the church. He puts himself at the feet of the church saying, whatever the church would want me to do, I will do. After graduating from the Father Duenas High School Seminary in 1964, Anthony entered the Capuchin Franciscan Novitiate in Massachusetts and was ordained priest on August 26, 1972. A cloud of sadness hung over what should have been the fulfillment of his childhood dream. Well, I came home seven years after leaving Guam. I was in theology. She was dying of cancer. It was before she died that she asked me one final time, son, is this what you want to be, a priest? I said, mom, this is where the Lord is leading me, I think. Then that's when she said, serve your brothers and sisters. That's why when I became a bishop, that was the motto I've chosen, serve your brothers and sisters serve as stewards means your servant. His mother's passing plunged the then deacon Anthony into indescribable sorrow. He was very close to her. He was uh, ordained a year after she died. It was really emotional. <laughs> there was one moment when I was watching her before she died where I almost wanted to leave the seminary, leave the church, run away from home, go, go away, just disappear. Like John Wayne, you know, fade with the sunset. And uh, luckily there were people surrounding me who encouraged me not to give up and not to be discouraged. Thus, the young Capuchin persevered in his priestly formation and obtained his master's degrees in divinity, theology, and liturgical studies in the U.S. mainland. Donning the brown habit of St. Francis his spirit of prayer was forged. As Franciscans and specifically as Capuchin for many years, really the emphasis is that we need to spend time before the Lord. Uh, that's the meditation time or uh, mystical time if that person is given that. And we caught up early on that before you can give Christ away, you have to have Him. And of course, that was also a part of our practice as Caption Franciscans, that prayer is very, very important. And even as uh, a young priest, is what was manifesting that, like, that he was a prayerful man. Prayer is what will so sustain you really in moments of doubt and sometimes in moments of despair or even in moments of sadness or tragedy. Huh? I think innately, deep in our hearts, we really are a religious being. And we cannot deny that. And the more we are in tune with God, so to speak, the more God tends to be in tune with us, especially at the moments when we need Him. By grace, Father Anthony returned to Guam in 1974, where within four years of his homecoming, he was appointed rector of the Dolce Nombre de Maria Cathedral. He's very meticulous in, in how things are, state, are, are set or staged or prepared for, for Mass. Um, Everything is sacred, especially on the altar. You go up to the altar, you have to bow or genuflect. It was in this same cathedral where Father Anthony was appointed auxiliary to Bishop Felix Berto C. Flores in 1983 and later ordained bishop on February 19, 1984. By 1986, at only 40 years old, Anthony Aperon was installed the second Archbishop of Agagna. I happened to be in Rome and Archbishop Aperon invited me to, to go with him. But when the office door opened for the Pope, Pope John Paul came out beaming and smiling and the words that came out of the Pope's voice was, ah, Archbishop, my youngest Archbishop in the world. They went in and the door closed. And when I heard the youngest archbishop in the world, I thought, wow, he's going to be serving for a long time. Yeah. 
Like Pope John Paul the Great, the newly appointed Bishop Aperon professed a deep devotion to the Blessed Virgin. Prominently displayed on the Archbishop's crest are the crescent and the star, traditional symbols of Mary, who is patroness of Guam under the title Santa Maria Camelen. This deep love for the Mother of God continues to inflame in him an unwavering commitment to the preservation of life. You cannot really be a true and genuine Catholic if you do not believe in the sacredness of human life. And for us, it, it begins at the moment of conception to natural death. Otherwise, it's hypocrisy to celebrate the Feast of the Immaculate Conception of Mary. So every Catholic must be able and be willing to defend the life of a child. That's really is very fundamental. I would not be a, a genuine bishop if I, I don't continue to stand up in defense of human life. Legislation for or against abortion has long been a contentious issue on Guam. But the Archbishop is known for zealously promoting the cause of life. We decided to do some research and found out that Guam was one of the easiest places in the United States to get an abortion, which I, I thought was scandalous. Yes, we can pass laws, but hearts and minds still have to be changed. And this is where the church comes in. And this is what we uh, mean to be a source of support for the Archbishop when it comes to that. But because of his lead, because of his direction and encouragement, uh, we've been able to garner the public support that we needed to affect the changes that, uh, that we're hoping to see in this regard. I've seen how uh, the office can have its toll on the man, on the person occupying the office. And, and oftentimes I know when, when, when he's criticized uh, because of issues of gambling, because of issues of uh, uh, pro-life and, you know, and so forth, it can take its toll. But I also see his resilience and his desire to embrace the office in which oftentimes can be difficult, but nonetheless, um, as difficult as, as things may get, he understands fully the importance of the role in which he plays as the Archbishop of Guam and that setting uh, one's life aside because of the need to be that leader for the Church of Guam. We can never not do enough. We can always try to find ways to help improve our lot, so to speak, to live in a world as Catholics and not be willing to just sacrifice that and go elsewhere to look for some kind of a fulfillment which may be temporary.